Well, good morning and welcome to Fellowship Baptist Church. It is good to see everyone here this morning. I got a few announcements for you. If you're a guest, welcome. I'd like to say welcome to you first. You're our special guest of honor. Make sure you fill out a visitor connect card and place it in the plate by the front door as you're making your way out this afternoon. Uh, for members only, we have a business meeting tonight starting at 6 o'clock. Please make sure you're here if you're a member. And if you're part of the finance team, we have a finance meeting directly before that, 5 o'clock, so make sure you're here for finance. If you have a youth member in this church, they're going to go on a blocking event. If you've seen the pink flamingos around town, they're going to go and grab those flamingos and take them somewhere else. And that's part of the call and their ministry there. So they are going to meet here at 6 o'clock. Is that right, Nathan? So 6 o'clock, that's 30 minutes before we normally start. So make sure that you're here prior to 6 o'clock if your youth is going to be attending that and going off and, and doing their thing. So uh, the float trip is coming up this upcoming Saturday. Make sure that you get with Melissa Yandel and make sure that she's right here. Make sure that you know or make sure that she knows she has a total account number. Make sure she knows that you're included in that. So make sure you see Melissa. And then we're going to start doing some OCC prep stuff on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. So make sure that you're uh, up to date on that. Don't You don't want to miss Sunday nights and Wednesday nights as we begin ramping up with OCC, packing those boxes, so on and so forth. Uh, do we have an OCC video this morning? Not this week. Next week. Okay. I didn't want to miss it. I missed it last week. So. Other than that, uh, glad to see everybody here. Last thing, tithes and offerings. If you'd like to give, we have two ways to give. You can give through the plate at the front door again and then uh, through our app PushPay. And make sure that you are staying connected with us through our online bulletin or paper bulletin. I'm going to pray for us and we're going to get started. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you again this morning. Lord, I'm so thankful to be back in your house. I'm thankful to be here with other believers who uh, have come and assembled together to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, to lift high the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who we have all of our hope and all of our trust God, that he's it. That's it. It's just Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's who we trust in, who we put all of our hope and our faith in. And it's he who we come to this place this morning to lift up, to praise and to worship because of what he's done for us on the cross, because of the eternal life we have through him. Father God, so I pray as we enter this time of worship, I pray that we would make a joyful noise unto you. I pray that you would be delighted this morning as we praise you. Father God, I pray and I invite the Holy Spirit into our midst this morning. God, because we know, we understand that we can do nothing apart from your Holy Spirit here. Nor would we want to, nor would we try. So Holy Spirit, come and be with us, be among us this morning. And Father God, as we open up your word, as we begin to study, I pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning. That, God, that you would challenge us to leave here this morning a little differently than we came in that we would be able to take your text and apply it to our lives. Father God, that we may be the hands and feet of Jesus, the light and salt of the community. When people are struggling, when people are hurting, when, when we meet people in our workplaces in our neighborhood, God, that they would see something in us and we would be able to point them to Jesus. We invite you here. We, we thank you for allowing us to come and assemble in your house. Be with us in this time. We love you. Thank you, and it's in the name above every other name that we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
if you're kind of new here, we, we started this corporate prayer stuff a little differently several weeks ago, and we're fixing to enter into that time, and I, I want to share with you kind of what's been on my heart this week. Martin Luther, not King, but Martin Luther said this, he said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. I want you to think about that for one second. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. I think there's so much truth in that statement. And as I thought about that statement this week, I thought how true that is, not only in our Christian walk, but in everything else in our life. I don't believe you can survive as a Christian without prayer. I don't believe your marriage can survive without prayer. I don't believe your children can survive in this world without prayer. I don't believe a church can survive without prayer. Amen. Prayer is the very lifeline that sustains us. But I also understand that going through life we have trials, we have difficulties. And last week we talked about trials a little bit. We're going to talk about that a little bit more this morning. I understand that life brings about hard times. So that in those hard times, it can be difficult to pray. It can be difficult to even want to pray, to desire to pray. And as many of you know, I, I'm a huge Southern Gospel fan. I love Southern Gospel music. Kind of weird that way, baby. Gold City is one of my favorite, all-time favorite bands. You don't know who Gold City is, I'm sorry. Gold City sang a song back in the 90s. The title of that song was called Pray. Some of the lyrics of that song say, When you don't feel like praying, When you don't feel like praying, pray. There are some of you in here this morning that may be finding yourselves in situations where you don't feel like praying. You're struggling in an area, and I don't know what that area is, but, but you're saying, I'm finding it really difficult to spend time in prayer. That song would tell you when you're having a hard time, when you don't feel like praying, pray. See, I think that too often we feel like prayer is an obligation. It's something that we have to do as a, as a Christian. And I would say that it's the exact opposite of that. I would say that praying is a privilege. Praying, going before God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, Going before his presence is a privilege. When you don't feel like praying, pray. When you don't feel like coming to the altar, that's the best time to come. There was somebody, I'm sure that many people have said this, but another quote that I've looked up or saw it says, When you don't feel like praying, pray until you feel like praying. When you don't feel like praying, pray until you feel like praying. My prayer is that this morning for you all, for this church, is that as we continue down this road of talking about prayer in our lives and putting an emphasis on prayer in the church, I pray that even when you don't feel like praying, even when it's getting maybe a little redundant, that that's really the time that you would buckle down and you would, you would come before God's throne on your knees and beg Him, spend time with Him, speak to Him, talk to Him, and pray until you feel like praying again. Maybe you're going through something. Pray. Even if you don't feel like praying. Because that is the very lifeline that sustains us. Remember Luther's quote. Basically he's saying, 
A Christian cannot survive without prayer no more than you can survive without breathing. That's how essential prayer is in your life. As we go into this time of prayer, I invite you to come to the altar and to pray with me. And I'm going to even challenge you further, even if you don't feel like it. When you don't feel like it,
in the direction that you have us go. I pray that you would guide our actions and guide our leadership and direct us as we strive to follow you each and every day. God, continue to be with us this morning. Stir the hearts of your people. Speak to your congregation this morning, and I pray especially right now in a congregation this size if there's somebody in here that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, God, I pray that this morning would be the morning that you open their eyes to the truth. I pray that you would give them understanding that they need you this morning. That if they don't accept you, they are eternally separated from you forever. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw them this morning. Finally, I pray that they would respond out of the deep. We give you this time. We're thankful that you've given us this time. And we ask in Jesus' name.
If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to return to the book of James. If you were here last week, you know that we started a new series. The series is in the book of James. We're going to go through the book of James in 13 weeks. And last week we talked about kind of why James wrote this book. It's not really doctrinally themed. It's more practical. And we talked about two reasons James wrote this book. One was to, to challenge believers to examine themselves to see if they're really in the faith. And then the second reason was to build our faith, to strengthen us, to train us to walk according to the Word. That's why we're going through this series. So this morning we're going to find ourselves in the book of James in our second week here in the book of James. Last week we talked about trials. This week we're going to talk about a new category. Last week we said that each week we would focus on something different, so this week we'll be on something different. But before we jump in, I want to play a short game with you to get your mind geared ready for this text. I'm going to say a word, and then I want you to say what you think that word means. Ready? Watch. You guys are not awake. <laughs> this is an opportunity for you to speak. Okay, so we have to observe, and then we had time. There are two meanings to that word. To watch out, right? Or I could say... 
my watch says 11 o'clock. There's two meanings, right? Let's try another word. Let's go with bat. Okay. Okay. <laughs> She's thinking of an animal that's flying, but if I said I have a baseball bat, that word means something different. All right, last one. Ready? Park. To a play, a place to play, or to park your vehicle. So if you did your English homework, you know that these words are called homonyms. They are spelled the exact same way, but have two completely different meanings, right? You spell watch the same way no matter how you're using it in context, but it's the context that determines what that word means, okay? This is one of the challenges in the English language that makes the English language so difficult for people to learn as a second language. There are something like over 300 homonyms in the English language. But homonyms aren't just in the English language, they're also in the Greek language. And as, if you know, the, the New Testament of the Bible was written in Greek. What we're going to be introduced to this morning is a Greek homonym. And that homonym is pronounced parasmos. Parasmos. Parasmos can have two meanings in the New Testament. It can mean trials, which we talked about last week, or it can mean temptations, and that's what we're going to talk about this week. And what we're going to see this morning in this text is we're going to see James use parasmos in both of those contexts. So we need to talk about this word parasmos and trials and temptations. That's where we're going to start this morning. If you have opened up your Bible to the book of James, we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. I'll invite you to go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. And we will begin. Beginning in verse 12, James says, Blessed is the man who endures, depending on which version you have here, you're going to see that first Greek word, parasmos. Some of your Bibles are going to say temptation. Some of your Bibles are going to say trials. Temptation and trials means two different things, though. Blessed is the man who endures temptation or trials, depending on your version. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is, here we go again, tempted, parasmos. I am parasmos, tempted by God. For God cannot be, here it is again, tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, is, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I want to bring you a message this morning I have titled The Truth About Temptation. The Truth About Temptation. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you again this morning in prayer. Father, we, we pray that as we uh, examine your word this morning, as I try to preach this text, Lord, the, the difficulty of the English language and the Greek language, Father God, I pray that uh, you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would simply use me as your mouthpiece, as a vessel, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would clear my mind of all distractions. I pray that you would simply speak through me and speak to your congregation this morning. I pray that for the congregation as well. I pray that we would be able to set our distractions aside and focus on the truth of your text. Father God, teach us something this morning. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So the truth about temptation. Last week we talked about trials. This week we're talking about temptation. In this transition verse that we're looking at here, verse 12, has that word parasmos in it. We need to determine, does that word mean trial or does that word mean temptation? Half of you are going to say it means temptation because that's what your Bible says. The other half of you are going to say it means trials because that's what your Bible says. Throughout the entire New Testament, this parasmos is used in both meanings, in both 
context. In order for us to determine what this word means, I think that we need to first examine the difference, this will be your point number one, the difference between truth, or excuse me, between trial and the difference between temptation. We're going to look at the, the differences between these, okay? I want to give you the definition of each before we begin. Here's the definition of trials. Circumstances which are hard but meant to strengthen our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. This is what a trial is, and we talked about this last week. Circumstances which are hard to go through, but they're meant to strengthen our relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? Now we're going to look at temptation. Temptation. A lie that something will satisfy our desires more than God's plan for us. Now I want you to say that second word with me. It's a what? It's a lie that something will satisfy our desires more than God's plan for us. That's what temptation is. So you see the difference in a trial in temptation. A trial is meant to strengthen you. Temptation is meant to destroy you. Now if we remember our text from last week, back in verse 2, if you have your Bible there, James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. There you have trials. The intent of the trial, right? Count it all joy. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, lacking nothing. You see, the trial is meant to draw you closer to God, to strengthen you. But that's not what temptation is meant for. So now let's fast forward to verse 12. I'm going to change versions on you here. The first time I read it was in the New King James Version. Now I'm going to read it in the NASB. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Now what I want to explain to you about trials and about temptation are trials that you're supposed to go through a trial. You're supposed to endure a trial. You're supposed to start the trial and come out the other end of the trial. That's not what you're supposed to do with temptation. You see, temptation, you are supposed to resist temptation, to escape temptation. You don't, you don't go through the temptation. You stay away from the temptation. I want to give you four ways to look at trials and temptations and compare them as we move forward, discovering this difference, right? Here's the first difference between trials and temptation as we try to unpack this. Number one, you will go through trials. You do not have to give in to temptation. There's truth number one. Back in verse two, it says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You will go through these trials. God will use circumstances in your life to strengthen you, to build you up, to make you and conform you more into the image of Jesus Christ. You will go through trials, but here's the truth. You do not have to give in to temptation. Right. Amen? Amen? Amen. Number two. Trials are opportunities to grow with God, which we just looked at in verse two. Temptations are opportunities to choose something other than God. Right? We looked at this back in verse two. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, right? But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Now look at verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because he's persevering, he's enduring the trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. Which the Lord God has promised to those who love him. But now look at verse 13. No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own desires. You see, the trial is an opportunity to grow with God. The temptation is an opportunity to choose something other than God and be, look at verse 14, be tempted and be carried away from God by your own desires. You see it? 
Now, my third one is very similar to number two. Let's look at the third truth here. Trials, or excuse me, God's intent in trials is to build you up, which we've looked at. Again, this is very similar to two. But I want you to pay attention to this. God has an intent through your trials, but Satan has an intent through your temptation. God's intent in trials is to build you up. Look at Satan's intent. Satan's intent using temptation is to what? To tear you down. To destroy you. Look at verse 15. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. Do you see how the difference? Do you see how God's desire, God's plan is to use one to strengthen you, to build you up, to make you and conform you more into the image of Christ. But Satan's desire is to use temptation to destroy you. Here's the fourth truth. Enduring trials gives life. Falling into temptation brings death. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials or temptation. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. You go through these trials. Remember what we talked about last week? That they're, they're a test. And many people will fail the test when things don't go the way that they want to in life. And they'll walk away and say, I'm done with this. It's a test. Those who persevere to the end will be saved. Those who have gone through the trials, those who persevere through the trials... Once they've been approved, after those trials, they will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised in verse 12. So verse 15 says, But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own sin. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is when its full course, brings forth death. Going through the trials, persevering through the trials, brings life. Giving in to sin brings death. Now maybe you're saying, okay, now which one does it mean here? Again, I'll re-emphasize the point that you endure the trial. The point is for you to go through the trial. You persevere through the trials of life as you're being built up in Christ, as you're conforming to his image, if that's happening in your life, through the trials in your life, you will be the one who receives the crown of life. Because you're enduring, you're persevering through the trial. Temptation is not meant for you to endure through. It's meant, to you, it's meant for you to resist from. Abstain from temptation. Flee temptation. Flee the devil. Not sit there and endure it. I believe the accurate word here in this transition verse is trial. Blessed is the man who perseveres, who endures the trials of life. Because if he's enduring the trials of life, he will be approved at the end, and he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Do you see the difference? But do you see how that word can mean two very different things, depending on the context that you put it in? All throughout the New Testament, this word can mean either trials or it can mean temptation. It's the same word. Now that we've looked at the difference between these two words, we're going to look at the danger. Point number two, the danger. Verse 13 through 15 says, No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. For when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is run its course, brings forth death. The first sub-point under point number two I want to show you is your tendency. Your tendency. And this is what your tendency is. It's to blame others for your sin. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. We have a tendency to blame others for the sin in our lives, do we not? If you have children, you know this is true. Because when something goes wrong in the house, the house is destroyed, or they forget to do something, or so so on and so forth, when they misbehave, and you call all three of them down front, what do they do? 
wasn't me. It was that one or that one. It wasn't me. But don't be too hard on your kids because guess what? You were the same way. And guess what? It didn't start with you either. What happened back in the way in the beginning? Remember at the beginning of the Bible, Adam and Eve? What happened there? God came to Adam and said, Adam, did you eat of the forbidden fruit? And he said, it, it was the woman. And then what did he say? That you gave me. It's not my fault. It's the woman's fault. But then it's your ultimate fault because you gave her to me. What did, what did Eve say? It wasn't my fault. It was, it was the devil's fault. You see, we have a natural tendency to blame others for the sin in our life. But I want to show you the truth in this. It's not Eve's fault, or it's not Satan's fault, rather. It's not, it's, it's not someone else's fault who we're trying to blame. I want to show you the next thing. We just looked at your tendency. Let's look at your desire. Your desire. Verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his or her own lust. Does it say, but each one is tempted away, or tempted and carried away when Satan tempts them? But each one is tempted when he's carried away by that drink? No. You see, we all have temptation in our life. You will not go through this life without facing temptation. The truth of the matter is, we don't have the same temptation. For one person, you might struggle with food, gluttony, right? But that doesn't affect the person next to you. For another person, it might be tobacco. If you're trying to put tobacco in, you, you can't for years. Tobacco may not affect the person next to you. What about alcohol? You might struggle with alcohol this morning, but the reality is not everybody in here struggles with alcohol. Maybe it's a, a picture on a screen. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's driving by somebody's really nice house and saying, I, I, I could just have that. Maybe it's excessive spending. Who knows? I don't know what your temptation is this morning, but what I do know is each and every one of us have one, but they're all different. They're all different. But here's the truth. Cigarettes don't tempt you. They just don't. I don't have a taste for that. Do cigarettes tempt you? You're not asking first name. Cigarettes are an inanimate object. How do cigarettes tempt you? They cannot by definition because they can't in and of themselves do anything. That'd be like saying this chair tempts you. Does alcohol tempt you? Again, not what you're showing here. It is an inanimate object. It cannot tempt you. A screen, a picture, doesn't tempt you. It doesn't tempt you. I've heard a lot of preachers say, oh, the world tempts you. I believe Satan uses the world and the things in the world to tempt. But here's another truth. Satan is not omnipresent nor omniscient or anything else. He, he, he is not tempting each and every one of us. He can't be. He can't be everywhere at once. He can be tempting you if Satan is on your back or in your presence, but I hope that's not true for any of us. But Satan, let's think about this, the CEO of all evil in the world, I think he's got bigger things to do than tempt you with a drink. Coming up with false religions and how to corrupt politicians who are leading countries and so on and so forth. Now, Satan does have an army of minions that can obviously tempt us. I'm not saying Satan cannot tempt you. I'm saying most likely Satan is not tempted. Now, he does have an army of demons and such that can also tempt you. But odds are, you don't have a demon following you around either. You're perfectly capable of falling into the sin yourself without the help of Satan, without a demon. Because look at verse 14. Again, each one is tempted when he is carried away or enticed by what? Your own lust. It's your lust for that thing that is tempting you. You know what this enticed word here means? Out of all the commentaries and everybody that I listened to and read, 
this this entice. It means it means like a lure or a trap, like you're fishing. You throw this lure into the water, and this fish is so enticed by this lure, it forgets that there could be a hook on it. It forgets. It doesn't think about that this thing is going to cause death. It lures them in. It's the same thing. When you see this thing that's enticing you, this temptation, it's a lure. And oftentimes we forget that it's them. We forget that it has hooks in it, that it has barbs in it. And it's going to snatch us, and it's going to bring forth death. You are drawn into your sin, into temptation, by your own self, your own desires. I'm not drawn into cigarettes again, because that's not my desire. I'm my temptations are other things. So you can't say that this thing tempted me. This thing made me do it. Satan made me do it. How many people have heard Satan made me do it? Satan made me, made me do it. Satan made me do it. You were completely capable of giving in all on your own. That leads me to my third sub point. My third sub point is it's your fault. It's your fault. 14 and 15 again. But when each one is tempted, he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. It's your fault. Then look at this. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has run its full course, brings forth death. Now, this can be a challenging passage. To, this verse 15 can be challenging to understand. I want to try to break it down in something that would be easy to remember. There's a process here, right? You see this process of, that lust has to be conceived, and then it gives birth, and then when the sin grows up, it brings forth death, right? You see this. I want to show you kind of what this would look like in maybe your own life. It starts with your eyes. You see this thing. House, new car, drink, picture on a computer screen tobacco, whatever the thing is, you see it with your eyes. Then your heart says, that looks good. The heart says it looks good to the eyes. Okay? Your heart is that lion, that temptation, lying to you. Who's the biggest liar you know? If you say anybody other than yourself, you're lying. You are the biggest Liar, you know. Now, Satan obviously is the father of all lies. If you don't know Satan personally, right? in your realm of people, you're the biggest liar. You know why? There was a study done that said something like there was the human brain has like 20,000 thoughts or something like that per day. That is 20,000 opportunities to make the right decision or the wrong decision. Your eyes see it, your heart now says, that's good. That looks good. And it tells your mind it's good. It's good to eat. The fruit is good. Once the mind understands, it starts concocting a plan. It's growing. It goes from your eyes to your heart to your mind to your hands and feet. Action. And that's what brings forth death. You see, it's your eyes first that see this. But then your heart is is, is evil above all understanding. People say, oh, just follow your heart. That's horrible advice. Your heart lies to you. You must understand when you're being tempted by something and your heart is telling you that that, that is good, your heart is lying to you. Let me say that another way. You are lying to yourself. That's the truth. You are lying to yourself. Your heart is telling you that, that this is good to eat. It's your fault. You do not have to give in to temptation. You can turn away. You don't have to give in. Your eyes see it. Your heart says it's good. It lies to you. Your mind conceives a plan. Gives birth to your hands and feet in the action. Look at the important number three in this section. James does not want you to be 
deceived. He doesn't want you to be deceived where and what the purpose of trials are and where temptation and what the purpose of temptation is. Remember last week we talked about trials. This week we're talking about temptation. Verse 16 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters, because of what? Because of what we just got done talking about last week. You see, you're going through these trials, and I'm telling you that God's going to use these trials to strengthen you, to build you up, to conform you into the image of Christ. But don't be deceived because temptation is not from Christ. It's from Satan. You're lying to yourself. Your heart is evil. Don't be deceived where trials come from. Don't be deceived where temptation comes from. And furthermore, don't be deceived of their purpose. You need, you need to understand where each comes from and what the purpose of each is. One's meant to build you up and one's meant to destroy you. I want to give you four truths that are laid out between 16 and 18. Do not be deceived. And here's what James says. Number one, don't be deceived because God does not tempt anyone. There's point number one. Verse 13. No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Don't be deceived where it's coming from, because it's not coming from God. Number two, God is good, and therefore only gives good gifts. Verse 17a, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. God doesn't give bad gifts. You're a child of the king. He's not luring you into temptation. He only gives good things because he is good. Number three, God is unchanging. Verse 17b. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. This means he is unchanging. He was good then, he's good now. And he will be good later. We worship the God who was, who is, and who is forevermore good. He gave good gifts then. He gives good, good gifts now. And he will always give good gifts. Nothing God gives will be bad. Number four. Finally. Number four. God loves you. Look at verse 18. In the exercise of his will, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we may... So that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creature. Listen, God called you out of darkness. He showed you the light. He showed you the truth. He called you out to be a child of himself because he loves you. And if he loves you, he's not going to give you something that's bad for you. Temptation, something that's going to kill you is like poison. I love my children. I would not give them, I would not tempt them with poison with something that would kill them. The same can be true of our Father. He's not going to give you something that can kill you. That's bad for you. It's only good things. Only good things. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. You need to understand the difference in a trial and in a temptation. You need to understand what they're there for, why you're going through them. You need to understand why you're going through a trial and you need to understand what temptation is all about. You need to understand the danger in that temptation. And you must understand that you have the say-so to walk away. You don't have to give in to temptation. You have to go through the trial. You don't have to go through the temptation. You need to understand it's your fault. When you give in, it's your fault. It's because that thing is attracted to you. It may not be attracted to everybody else. It's attracted to you. It's your fault. Your heart lies to you and tells you that this is good to you. If you have your Bible, I want to show you one other passage. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 10.13. 1 Corinthians 10.13. Let me give you a moment to turn there. Because if, if you have your Bible, I want you to highlight this, underline it, put a star next to it, bookmark it. Whatever you've got to do, do that in your Bible. It is highlighted in my Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's on the screen if you don't have a Bible. It says this. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. The God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted 
beyond what you are able. He will not allow you to be tempted with something that you absolutely have no power against that you can't turn away, which tells me that you have the ability to say no to that temptation. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But listen to this. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape. You need to underline that. You need to remember that. And I want to give you an easy way to remember that. The NYPD, the New York Police Department, all police departments have codes that they call out. It's a code whatever. You know what the, the NYPD code for 1013 is? Officer needs help. Officer needs help. I can't do this on my own. I need help. You find yourself in temptation. You go to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You cry out, God, come 10, 13. I need help. I can't do this on my own. Get me out of here. Help me resist. You know what the other police departments use code 10, 13 for? Danger ahead. Danger ahead. Code 1013. Danger is ahead of me. You find yourself being tempted by whatever it is. Whatever that thing is that's calling out to you. Whatever your heart's telling you that's good. Which is a lie straight from the devil. You call out. Code 1013 God. I need your help. And 1013 says. That he is faithful. You need to underline that. God is faithful. He will show up. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your capability to turn it away, to turn it down, to say no. And then he will provide a way of escape. But you've got to be looking for it. You've got to want to escape it. You've got to say no to your heart, say no to the lie, and say, God, I desire your truth more than I desire this sin, this lie from Satan, this thing that's telling me that it's going to feel so good. Here's my final thought that I want to leave you with. Last thing on the screen. Last thing up there. Every temptation that you encounter is an opportunity to, I underline these words, trust in the truth of God, or what does that say? Listen to the what? Lie of the enemy. You must understand when you are being tempted by something, that is an opportunity to listen to, or I'm sorry, excuse me, to trust in the truth of God's word, to trust in God himself, or to listen to the lie of the enemy. It is your decision. And if you give in to that temptation, it's your fault. Sure, Satan roams around like a roaring lion, Peter 5 8. He, roars, he roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Sure, he does. He's looking for someone to devour. He's not everywhere at once. He's not on your back. He's not following you around. His, his, his dominions, his his. His army of wickedness, his demons. In Ephesians 6, putting on the armor of God. Yes, because they're crafty. They're coming up with all of these lies to tell the world. But you have the ability. You have the capability. You have the option to give in or to withstand the temptation. You have to go through the trial. To get to the end. To get to the other side. You don't have to give in to temptation. You cry out, code 1013, God. I need help. I need a way out. And he is faithful. And he will bring you out of that temptation. I don't know what you're being tempted by today. But what I can tell you is this. Every single person in here is being tempted. Don't kid yourself that you're the only one. Every single person in here has a temptation that they struggle with. And it's probably something that you struggle with for a really long time, for years possibly. Today is the day that you can break free 
from that temptation. Because you can understand the truth about a trial. You can understand the truth about temptation. God will provide a way out. You understand the dangers. And it's your fault. You have the capability to say no. Don't feel like you're the only one that struggles with temptation. It might be different from the person sitting next to you, but I promise they have one too. They have a struggle. Their heart lies to them just like your heart lies to you. Today is the day. So I'm done with this temptation. I'm done fighting this thing. I'm crying out, 1013, God. I need help. There's danger ahead. And this danger, this life, brings forth death. It separates me from you. I don't know what you're struggling with today, but save it today. Give it to God. Code 1013. The altar will be open. I'll be down in front if you want to talk. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you now, Lord, as we have spent the last two weeks in the book of James, and we spent last week looking at trials. God, last week we, we looked at that we are to be joyful and to be thankful for the trials in our life. And God, we know that that is difficult to do because trials are they're painful. But God, we say thank you because we go through them with joy and with thankfulness because we understand that you're using that time, you're using that opportunity, you're using that trial to strengthen us, to build us up, to conform us more into the image of Jesus Christ. And God, as we look at temptation this morning, God, we understand that we are responsible for our own actions. That inanimate object, as tempting as it may be, is not tempting us. It's, it's our flesh. It's, we're being drawn away by our own lustful desires that, that are deep within our heart, that we desire that deep down. That's what's drawing us away. It's not an object. It's a deep-rooted, sinful desire within us that's, that wants that, that finds pleasure in that. God, we cry out to you this morning. Code 1013. God, we need help this morning. We need you to provide us a way out. We need you to provide victory over these things that have a hold on us, God. God, there's danger ahead. God, I pray for anyone in here that, that may be struggling with something. Maybe they, maybe they fell into temptation this morning. Maybe it was yesterday. Maybe, maybe it was this week. Maybe it's something they've been struggling with. God, we, we know and we understand now that we're tempted by our own desires. God, we ask that you, that you change our Change our desires, God. Let us, let us desire the things that you desire for us. Change our lusts. Change our passions. Give us passion and a desire to know you more. Spend more time in your word. Spend more time in prayer to be more Christ-like, to be more righteous, to be more and more like you each and every day. And the, the more we become like you, the more we become less like the world. God, help us this morning. We're crying out in a state of desperation. We're crying out 1013, God. Because these temptations, God, they're, they're, they're so strong. God, we understand now where they're coming from. They're coming from within us. Our eyes are lying to us. We, we see it, and, we, and then our heart tells us that it's good. We're lying to ourselves. God, help us not do that. Help your Holy Spirit within us to show us the truth this morning. 
Help us to trust your truth and not listen to the lie.